war, war continues and people are dying as we sit here. It's so frustrating that we can't make it stop. But we've never been able to make it stop. We rely on you to bring the world to peace in your time. And meanwhile, we breathe. We are here today to continue our study of Isaiah Lord, and we're 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 here in full strength for the first time in, in months. And we thank you for that. We thank you for each other and for this time together and for this friendship and the fellowship we have in this class. Lord, we thank you for Isaiah. Isaiah, we preached from Isaiah this morning, from, from second Isaiah, and it is a joy as, as are our children. So bless us. Bless us as we continue on in this, this study of Isaiah. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, a couple of things. Isaiah 40 through 55 is second Isaiah. I recommend that you read the whole thing. Just sit down and read it. You're going to see and be able to, 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 uh, to sense the difference from what the Isaiah we've been reading and this Isaiah. And so you'll be able to get this notion that uh, this is really urshaking. So, um, so, are there any questions? Uh, to let you, we wanted to kind of a recap here. <laughs> I'll give you a, a one minute recap. Okay. <laughs> one minute recap. Right, uh, in the period from, uh, from uh, 642, uh, 742 to about uh, 642 to 587 is the lifetime, is the ministry and mission of. Of Isaiah. During that period, uh, uh, Jerusalem, Judah was attacked uh, by the Assyrians. Uh, and so was Samaria to the north. Samaria to the north, of course, was was um, was exiled in 722. Uh, in six, uh, 702, uh, the Assyrians came and tried to, to uh, conquer Jerusalem, but they were turned away. Uh, and this was understood as being a major, a major victory for God. The the Rab Shakay of the of the Assyrian king stood at the foot of the walls, speaking in Hebrew, which frustrated uh, Hezekiah's uh, folks because they didn't want people in on this conversation. But speaking in Hebrew, he says, "You know, uh, you, you're saying that your God's going to protect you." I've um, uh, look at all the other gods that have been defeated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? This uh, so he was uh, Sennacherib was turned away, uh, in, uh, and we see we can see that from all kinds of sources. And uh, the people of Israel took that to mean that Jerusalem and temple were invulnerable because mm. that is where God uh, was uh, resided. And uh, the Assyrians were deceived, defeated in about six, uh, 611. Um, the uh, Babylonian, by the Babylonians, the Babylonians started to, uh, to attack Judah, finally got around to Judah in, around 600. And in 598, um, they entered the uh, entered, uh, came to Jerusalem, and the king at the time, uh, Jehoiakim, surrendered. Uh, and he was taken. He and the major part of his his leadership elite were taken into exile in Babylon. The uh, and this is this isn't this isn't Isaiah. First Isaiah stopped about the time of the death of Isaiah, which is in 687. Um, so there is no real Isaiah between 687 and about 582. Um, 
So we get this information from other sources. So in 597, the first exile, the Babylonians carried uh, a significant portion of the leadership of Judah uh, in Jerusalem into exile in Babylon. Unlike the Assyrians, they did not spread them out. They brought them in as a single community. And apparently, uh, uh, Jehoiakim re remained the king of Judah in exile and eventually ended up as his uh, at the king's table. Um, they came back in uh, the, the uh, Zedekiah was the success was the successor ruler, not the king really. He uh, was in um, was in Jerusalem and he rebelled against the Babylonians. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar came in in 587. This time he carried the rest of the population away and uh, destroyed the temple, burned it to the ground, and of course. Uh, and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. In 582, there was a final, uh, final exile uh, when there was apparently was a revolt uh, by people in Jerusalem looking for the return of Jehoiakim to be the king. So that's where we have come to right now. Uh, the people are in, in, in exile in Babylon uh, from uh, 589 to uh, to 538 when Cyrus the Mede uh, in about 540 he, he 42 he uh, Cyrus the Mede conquered the Persians the Medes are on the north end of the uh, uh, Zagros Mountains up in, the, up in the plain on the Iranian plateau the, the Medes are to the north and the Persians are to the south. Cyrus uh, uh, conquered the Persians and then began his conquest all the way to the, to the, uh, to the Dardanelles, to the Bosphorus. And then he started going, going east, eventually getting all the way to India. Um, the, um, uh, he conquered Babylon in 538 and unlike the, the Babylonian and the Assyrian conquest. He was a he was a very enlightened uh, despot. He is uh, um, he released. He, he recognized the gods, all the gods of all the different places. He respected them, and he released people from exile. Specifically, uh, the Jews released them, allowed them to return to Jerusalem in five thirty eight. We're in the beginning now, uh, in that period, somewhere between 582 and probably mm, 500 for this period of the, uh, of the uh, second Isaiah. And it's a change. It's a change. We read last week where it begins with comfort. Go comfort ye my people which is a, 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 ordinarily what we see are the, are the prophets giving words of judgment. But that's because there's so much wrong. <laughs> uh, the things that are, people just are not doing it right. But prophets speak to what's going on now. And now the people are in exile. They're, they are, Jeremiah wrote him a letter saying, okay, build houses. Build lives, respect this, pray for the city in which you find yourself, uh, make life for yourself. So they were doing that. They were doing that, but they 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 could not give up. Give up by the waters of Babylon. We wept. We saw it. Saw it on her cry. Uh, yes. How many people are we talking about in Babylon? The the, the um, Population of the whole city, well, or no, the, the exiles. The, the exiles. Eventually, probably, we don't know exactly. Tens of thousands, probably. Uh, we 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 believe Judah was around one hundred and fifty thousand, maybe two hundred thousand, uh, and um, they carried up into exile. Mm. 
20, 30,000. Those who remained in Judah were just the farmers and the uh, small, small businessmen. Who then served as slaves or? No, they were not slaves. What were they? They were, uh, they, they, they were like, they were just a column, like Chinatown. So what was the point of taking them to Babylon? Because they had to, to, to keep Israel, keep Judah from fighting. Oh, okay. So that, that took, took yeah, well, it didn't take the, the guts out of them mm -hmm. uh, uh, because they continued to try to revolve all the way down to 582. Uh, but eventually, there was nobody left okay. to, to, to organize. So interestingly, they didn't kill them. They no, took they didn't. them into exile. And that's the distinction between the, the Persians, the, the Cyrus, and the, uh, uh, and the Babylonians and the Assyrians before them. They worked on terror. Mm -hmm. They worked on terror. Cyrus is so, so beneficial. So benevolent that he is actually called. We'll see this later when we read Second Isaiah. He's called the Messiah, chosen by God. So we'll we'll get to that. So yes. And so the, then the, the writer of this second part is somebody else, right? That's but right. Also they, called they, Isaiah. They, they didn't know who when they were putting this stuff together. They didn't know who this guy was. Okay. Uh, or they 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 knew, but. Uh, he's not named. Okay. Uh, and so uh, the people who are assembling this assemble it along with the great, great, great prophet Isaiah. So now we have the, the great blessings of Isaiah extended, and we'll see it extended again for the period of Ezra and Nehemiah in the third Isaiah. Okay. Oh. In, the, in the Jewish comments, there's a lot of talk about second Isaiah might be a woman. Possible. That's, in, that's entirely possible because we know that there, there are uh, women prophets. Hulda is actually referenced earlier. Okay. Um, I have frequently said, both in the discussion of Isaiah and also in um, just all the time when I've talk, ever talked about the Old Testament, I've looked at it as a competition of the gods. Um, that's, what, that's how you can interpret it all. It gets very specific in the Exodus when Pharaoh, god of Egypt, gets, uh, has to compete with uh, Moses representing uh, Yahweh, the, the Lord of hosts, and Moses loses. Well, uh, this, is, uh, this is common. It's, I believe this is the key to understanding the Old Testament. Um, so it becomes explicit in 2nd Isaiah. Now, the conflict of the gods is a problem here because the God of Israel has been defeated. See, what do you do with that? Right? Um, the, 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 the Rob Shake for Sennacherib was right, you know. Uh, if Sennacherib had stuck around, he, he certainly would have destroyed Jerusalem, but he did not. And intervention from God, yes. Uh, but nonetheless, um, they, they were not impervious. They were not, uh, the, the God had reached the point where he let the uh, Jerusalem Judah be conquered. And it appears like uh, the gods of, uh, of Babylon prevail. That's tough. And uh, I, I marvel, I marvel at the Jews. Bless their hearts. What we see in we see in Second Isaiah a motif, which is a trial. And I'm going to go through this trial. It appears in a variety of places. Um, Isaiah 41, verse 21. I'm going to read to 29. 
Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proof, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, so that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome, or declare us to us the things to come. Tell us uh, what, what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God, do good or do harm, that we may be afraid and terrified. You indeed are nothing, and your work is nothing at all. Whoever chooses you is an abomination. I stirred one up from the north, and he has come from the rising of the sun. He was summoned by name. He shall trample on rulers as on border, as potter treads clay. Who declared it from the beginning? So that we might know, and beforehand, so that we might say, he is right. There was no one who declared it. None who proclaimed. None who read your words. I first had declared it to Zion, and I gave to Jerusalem a herald of good things. But when I look, there is no one. Among you, there is no counselor who, when I ask, gives an answer. No, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. <laughs> Their images are empty wind. Now, this is a trial we're going to see later called witnesses and maybe summations, etc. But uh, this is a this is a legal case. Okay, uh, state your case. State your case. It's a judicial process that's going on here. Now, uh, and, and the basic case is in verse twenty-two. Tell us of the former things, what they are, so that we might consider them, and that we may know their outcome, or declare us things to come. Now. Uh, how do we know that Yahweh, uh, the Lord, is God? Right? Uh, because God has predicted this. That's the basic case to use. Now, that's a whole lot different from saying he's going to beat your God. We have, a, we have God reframed here as, and, and this is this is a theme that's going to go all through second. Second Isaiah, and it's a, uh, a, a powerful, a powerful um, uh, uh, reframing. Um, the gods, so Isaiah has, uh, uh, has um, the, the proof that God is really God, is the knowledge of the future, and down here in verse uh, 24, you indeed, you gods, and you are nothing, and your work is nothing at all. You have no power. We have seen this, this notion that these other gods have no power uh, in, uh, in Isaiah uh, and in, in Jeremiah, who use the term gods who are no gods. And that's a, a, a null factor. They, they recognize that people worship these other gods, but these are gods without power. And that's the distinction that we that that becomes focused on that, that becomes focused in a new way. Uh, there's not this uh, this great um, uh, uh, focus that God is uh, the day of the Lord is coming and everything's going to be fixed either when that happens or in the future, whatever you want to put it. This is not the day of the Lord kind of God. This is a God who predicted what happened in the past. They came. Um, and so uh, here in verse 25, I stirred up one from the north and he has come. Now, um, if you look at the map, of, uh, I should I should put it up. Um, I can call it if you want, but if you look at the map of the Middle East, you can see that the, um, that the Tigris, the, the Mesopotamia runs from uh, northwest to southeast and above the mountains there uh, yeah, are the Medes uh, and other countries out there, but certainly uh, on the uh, eastern side of that, the Medes are there. So uh, Cyrus comes from the north. 
so and, and this is similar to what we saw in in first in Isaiah, uh, where uh, he he says to Jerusalem, I called down my agent from the north, and we see him coming down from the north, and because uh, Assyria is not to the north, um, Assyria is north and east, but they have to come down that way to come through Damascus. They can't come directly from the east because that's desert. So um, when, sorry, I bet when we, he says, I stirred up one, um, one God or one? One person. One person. And he was summoned by name. And that name is Cyrus, and we'll get to that later. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. And so here's in 26, who declared it from the beginning so that we might know and beforehand so that mm -hmm. we might say he's right. Mm -hmm. um, no one. No one. Um, I first declared it to Zion. And these were the prophecies of judgment. I told them, and I told them, and I told them, but they didn't listen. But I did tell him. Mm -hmm. I forgot who does Zion mean, or what does it mean, or where? Zion. 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 Zion is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay. Thanks. Zion is the yeah. city of Jerusalem. Okay. okay. Um. So that's uh, the when, when I when in verse twenty eight when I look there is no one among these there is no counselor who when I ask gives an answer they are all a delusion. So is this a prophet saying that prophecy is more important than the, other, the relationship to the other idols, those idols? Well, he's saying, we'll see a little bit later. I will, I will get to that. The idols are nothing. Right, right. But I mean, is this what we're reading? A prophet saying that that is the way you know God? Yes. Is through prophecy? Uh, and that they're true. So the test of a prophet here is that it's true. Now, there are actually two tests of a prophet. One is that they, 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 they comply with the law. Prophets don't make law. Uh, they, they interpret the law. And the other is when they prophesy it's true. It works. Now, here's the difficulty. There's a difficulty with this. That we still struggle with. And that is the prophets aren't always true. Uh, Ezekiel and I think 33, no, Ezekiel 10, whatever, uh, made a whole chapter about the destruction of Tyre. Didn't happen. Didn't happen until 400 years later when, uh, when uh, the Assyrians really did it. Uh, Alexander the Great did it in 334. Uh, they didn't do it because uh, Tyre was an island. Uh, <coughs> Alexander filled in the distance to the causeway, made a causeway between, and then um, brought in the, um, uh, was able to conquer Tyre. So they're not always right. And the reason is, uh, is prophets interpret the present. And they interpret the present in the light of the law and God. And so prophets will say, you guys aren't doing it right. And therefore, these are the consequences that have already been laid out. Um, so uh, the prophets don't do it so that they can predict the future. They, they, there's this common interpretation of, of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, for instance, about God and Magog, you know, in, in, in Ezekiel, who is going to uh, uh, be uh, rise up against Judah. And some modern prophets say Gog and Magog are Russia, and they're getting ready to conquer the Middle East. Uh, that's had to change 
because Russia has declined, but maybe not. Anyway, um, that's not what they were trying to do. If, let's look at this for a moment. If that were what the prophets would really do, then what they were saying could have made no sense to the people they were preaching to. It was it was empty verbiage. Did you have no, it's okay. empty verbiage. That's all. Uh, so if we insist that, that that the prophets were real and spoke real concerns and had a real message to the people, we can't interpret the prophets that way because they would not have been able to know what in the world what in the world is this guy talking about. So uh, our problem is still today knowing the true prophets from the false prophets. And the difficulty is that the tests of the prophet, the two tests of the prophets, whether they follow the law and whether what they say is true when it comes to pass, right? Uh, and the difficulty with comes to pass is we don't know what's going to come to pass. So we can only interpret prophet after afterwards. That's why, for instance, um, in the time of Martin Luther King, and much like him, and I have come to believe now personally that what he, he was speaking the law and the truth and what he said was saying was really true. But I didn't think it at the time. I didn't think it at the time. So uh, it's, um, this is this criterion. This criterion that we know God's God because he speaks the truth is difficult. Well, I was thinking, you know, if there's sort of a time limit when it happens, you know, like they're not always predicting, well, it's going to happen in like 520 or something, you know, it, 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 it maybe happened. But how far is it yeah. distant from? And I don't know what to say about how to um, how to deal with that. Because you know, I'm a historian. I can find a historical precedent for anything, just, just a problem. Somehow, <laughs> I'll find it somewhere. Um, and, and that's what historians frequently do. They thought start with a thesis. Uh, and they look for evidence for it and then present that thesis and the events that prove it. It's what ordinary historians and then well, project that into the future. I, and that's really difficult. Yes. So one thing I would like to say is that um, we're we're focusing a lot on whether um, to define a, the prophet and if they are right. Yeah. And um probably what's most important is not worrying as much about the prophet as the word of God. Yes. Right. Yes. And so um, if it turns out that some of these um, things were wrong, um, that that may discount the prophet, but it doesn't discount the word of God. That's right. And, and that's one of the things that we saw in chapter 40. Mm -hmm. yeah. All, all leaves of grass, etc. Uh, uh, but the word of the Lord uh, uh, stands forever. Yeah. Say exactly. that that is another important transition that we find here, and, and that could only happen after they started to collect the writings. See, Scripture didn't. Uh, the word of the Lord stands forever. Is the word that comes out of the mouth of the prophets. Right. 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 Uh, and the law. Right. Right. Uh, but uh, you couldn't really rely on that because you didn't have a, a, a determined set of writings that were the word of the Lord. Right. So, and that's another shift that's happened. And that's how we got to be where we are. And, and it's no, no accident that Jesus is called the word. Yeah. So that's no accident. Now, it was... Uh, it was understood in a way in that time that uh, uh, that was easily accepted 
because the uh, Stoics uh, located a word, the logos uh, is, is a theme of Stoicism. And the logos to the Stoics was really kind of a rational principle. But uh, uh, John adopted it to mean the ultimate rational principle, which is God incarnate yeah. in Jesus. So it, um, it, it, this, this, this period that we're talking about right now is the period that leads to where we are today. Right. It's powerful. And, and for anybody who has anything to say bad against the Jews, um, you, you need to you need to go back to Greece, can I say? Yeah. Interestingly, I point out that I, I frequently mention that we don't preach much from the prophets in, in uh, Presbyterian church. We really not because we don't like the messages. Yeah. Uh, except Second Isaiah. We preach from Second Isaiah today. Yeah. Uh, and a really good sermon. Yeah. It was a lovely sermon. And I, I as I thought of that, and then I opened the hymn and I looked down at the bottom of the hymn was taken to second Isaiah. Uh, and uh, I, I, there were, for this portion of the hymn book, there were four other hymns that related to second Isaiah. Uh, and then I went back and checked the index in the hymnal and there are over 150 songs that relate to second Isaiah in one way or the other. In 150 uh, hymns, second Isaiah is somehow related to. So this is um, this is this is really powerful. This is as powerful as it gets. The, I look at the rest of the Old Testament, most of it, as background, so I can understand who Jesus was. And I don't think you can really do that unless you have some sense of, of um, uh, some sense of the Old Testament. So. Isaiah 41, so again, from verse 1. Now, this is the testimony of God. Listen to me in silence, O coastlands. Let the peoples renew their strength. Let them approach and then let them speak. Let us draw together near for judgment. Who has roused the victor from the east? Summon him to his service. He delivers up nations to him and tramples kings underfoot and makes them like dust with a sword, like driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safety, scarcely touching the path with his feet. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am first, and I will be the last. So this is... Uh, Kind of the testimony of God here. Saying, who 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 is the one that was stirred up from the east? Yeah, um, that would be Cyrus. Okay. If you're if you're from if you're from well Persia, Media, the Medes are in the north part, and the Persians are uh, to the from your perspective to the south, uh, and Cyrus was a Persian who conquered the Medes. So he would, the, the Persians would be to the east, the Medes to the north. Okay, verse 25. Here are some testimonies. Verse 25, did you say? Verse, chapter 45, oh. Oh, verse no. 20. 41. Chapter 45. 45. Verse, verse 20. 20. Okay. Assemble yourselves and come together. Draw near, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge. Those who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and pres present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? There is no other God besides me. A righteous God and a Savior, there is no one besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. I myself, I have sworn from my mouth, has gone forth in righteousness, a word that shall not return. 
To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Only, only in the Lord it shall be said of me all righteousness and strength. All who are incensed against him, all come to him and be ashamed. In the Lord of all the offspring of Israel shall triumph in glory. Okay, um, this is a continuation of the case now. Um, we're talking now about idols. We're going to get more to that, uh, that later. Wooden idols, they're praying to no God, to a God who's no God right here in verse 20. And he challenges them to present their case. Uh, and, and, and then and, and let them take counsel together. When all God's come together. Uh, and, and who was it? Who told this long ago? Once again, I declared in the bold, this is verse 21. Uh, this is this shows that God is really God, the God. But he says something here uh, that is really significant. He said uh, in verse 21, there is no other God besides me. Uh, verse 22, for I am God and there is no other. All right. Recall now Exodus 20, the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the issue for all the way up until now has been um, unfaithfulness because the people of Israel have included the worship uh, or one way or other have worshiped these other gods, even though they're no gods. They're, they, but Israel has done it. There's this tacit uh, 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 there's this tacit admission that there are other gods out there. Mm -hmm. You just shouldn't follow them. Mm -hmm. right? This is different. Said there are no gods. There are those. They, I am the only God. And this is where we are today, you see? Right. Uh, and, and, uh, and there is no other. We're making an advance here. We're making an advance. That becomes the theme of Judaism. There is but one God, and all these others are no gods. Now, in the New Testament, the church is going to take a little different uh, uh, take, have a little different take on that. They will say, and this is in the second century, that those who that the other gods are demons. Oh, good. and that that begin that's part of the development of the church. There are these other things out there, uh, but they're not just empty items. They're demons. They have some kind of power. Interesting. Uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's, a, it's, a, it's something that emerges out of Christianity. That's interesting. Uh, well, that, yes, that's interesting. I find. Because, as you said, each 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 uh, different people had their god, and there was this fight. And then suddenly, Israel is not pretending that God is just the god of Israel. He's the god of the earth. He's the god of all. So creation. it's not anymore uh, the, the god of each. Absolutely, which is interesting. And I never saw it. Like, Absolutely. Now we have seen already God declaring that all the world is going to come to Zion, right? All the kings of the world and all the powers of the world have come to Zion and worship God, which is not quite the same thing because we're looking at kingdoms that are uh, kings that are coming to to um, uh, to become God's vassals. Uh, that God's power is such that they can only surrender to Him. This is different. This is different. Yeah. Yes. When it says in twenty-two, turn to me and be saved. Where is heaven at this period of time? Where is what? Where is heaven? And our con conception of going to heaven, I mean, what's he talking about being saved? Well, um, to be saved is to be blessed by God, be on God's side, and he will preserve you. All right? Now, you have to start by asking, where's heaven? Where's heaven? <laughs> See, we are we are bound by this, the body we have, and in this body, uh, there are uh, there's 
this way and this way and this way and this way, this way, this way. And if we are forced to locate heaven, where are we going to point? We have to point up. Right. Uh, and if we're going to avoid, find another place, where? Sheol's down. The Greeks did it too. So um, now there's a there's a um, a fourth dimension, a spiritual dimension that becomes uh, uh, the the place where Christians place heaven as and hell. Um, uh, and but that's a much later uh, development. So is heaven indwelling? Within the person, um, they, Jesus says that the spirit of God, the kingdom of God, is the Greek word can either mean among or within you. Okay. Um, there is an attempt. There are, no, let me, let me rephrase that. Many people believe. That heaven is inside us, that there's some piece of God inside us. Um, okay. <laughs> that, 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 that works, particularly if you're of the romantic tradition that says we are basically good. Mm -hmm. If you're Calvinist, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, that's a, um, yeah, there, there's, Modern, a lot of modern religious concepts and even Christian theologies think that what we need to do is reach the divine inside us. Well, for instance, in the Lord's Prayer, um, that kingdom come, is it coming to earth or to our souls? Or what are well, we asking? It, it, yes. Uh, look at the, how it's portrayed in, in Revelation 22, the end, the very end of things. New Jerusalem new Earth. descends uh, and it becomes the new age. Now, that's, we're, we're talking, everything here is, is metaphorical. Um, so, uh, where is heaven? I can't point to it. I like to be said in the among us. And we've been talking about it being within us, but among us we can work on Well, that, that, that's the, the notion. It's an equally problematic notion. If the uh, kingdom of God is among us, right, which probably points to the church, uh, there's, a, there's enough in the church that tells me that God's going to have a hard time uh, being tolerant. <laughs> I, I find there is a nuance between finding God within us or letting God, letting the Spirit enter us. But the Spirit is the, the completely different from us. Right. It's like it is. I mean, this is this is the, the completely other who would dwell in us, not because we are good, because. Because he saved you will, and I that's so, right. And the interesting thing about that is if you look at it this way, it's possible to turn that spirit away to grieve the spirit. Oh yeah. Deny the spirit. So and then so it, right. I, the, the, from about 1850 on until 1950 for about a hundred years, particularly mainline Protestants have said inside us is a good place to be. Um, and God would love it to be inside us. His spirit's gonna be real comfy. Um, I, since World War I, that notion has been under stress. So far, yes, yeah. yeah. I was wondering after I turned to me and was saved, to me being saved means going to hell. So I was wondering what the concept of being saved was during this period of time. It, it is preserved. Just made safe. Uh, On the earth? Yeah. 
the notion of a, a, a life after death is just not there. Now, it's, it's in there in very, very, uh, very small bits. Ezekiel will say, uh, Son of man, can these bones live? And they had the resurrection of Israel, which suggests some kind of life after life. Um, and, and there are other small portions of the, the Old Testament this time, but it's not really until uh, we get to the, to the first century BC and with um, Daniel that we get a hint of a, of a resurrection. Uh, Much later. Okay, thank you. And then then it was forced on them because uh, they were following the law. And according to the rules, if you follow the law, uh, you, you're, you're, you're in good stead, right? Except that the Greeks were persecuting people for following the law, and that doesn't work in this lifetime. So from then, you start to develop the notion of a resurrection that allows, allows people who die for the faith to have their proper recognition and place with God. Uh, the notion of a of, of a uh, religious persecution was unusual in the ancient world. Okay, here's um, uh, verse 23. Um, By myself I have sworn, for my mouth has gone forth righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. You've heard that before. Uh, and we've read it before, it's in Ephesians um, or in Philippians. Philippians has this great song, uh, this great hymn. Let me be the same mind that, that, that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God uh, as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in a human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth un, and under the earth, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, and, and it's also something similar in Romans 1 8. Incidentally, the first part of that about who Jesus was, that comes right out of Second Isaiah. We'll get to that later. So, um, okay. Um, What's interesting, I have one quick question. Um, so do we think of the term Lord and God to be synonymous or um, not? The, the, in, in the tra modern translations, in the New Revised Standard, if you see the Lord in all caps, Big cap and mm -hmm. now all uh, the last four little caps. That means um, Yahweh. Okay. Okay. Which means um, God, the God, God, the one yeah. God. Uh, the term Lord uh, also is applied to Jesus a, in a way in John that that makes it seem like John is thinking Yahweh. Okay. Uh, but the term Lord is generically applied to Christ. And Lord, in that sense, means uh, a prince, a ruler, can also mean a husband. Uh, somebody of power. Uh, and so in terms of uh, being uh, the head of the kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says Jesus is Lord. That is a major confession found in the New Testament. Hmm. Uh, I never noticed that king. before. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to chapter 43, uh, verse 8. Bring forth the people who are blind, yet have eyes, who are deaf, yet have ears. Wait, did you say 43? 43. Chapter. 43. Oh, 43. eight. Start eight. with verse nine. Thank you. Okay. Well, this is more proof. Yeah. Okay. Let all the nations gather together and let the peoples assemble, who among them declare this and foretold this to us the four things. 
Let them bring their witnesses to justify them and let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. For me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. I declare and I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, says the Lord. I am God, and henceforth, and henceforth I am He. There is no one who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can hinder it? Okay, these are more proofs, but once again, um, the criterion is who predicted it. But there's something new here. We talk about the, we'll see more of this later when we get to the servant songs. He says here in verse 10, you are my witnesses. You are my witnesses, um, my servant whom I have chosen. Um, this becomes a new uh, role for Israel. Witnesses to one God. Now, in later Judaism, this becomes much, much more towards the uh, period of Jesus, but in later, or actually, in later Judaism, I, think, I guess probably early in the time, uh, you read the book of Jonah. Right? Uh, Jonah was um, uh, told to go to Nineveh, a pagan city. That's the Assyrian capital. Uh, Jonah didn't want to do it, he jumped overboard. Uh, and of course, got swallowed by a whale and spat out and went to Nineveh and proclaimed God to Ninevites, and they, they converted, for which Jonah went really mad. <laughs> this, I believe that this is an indication of the question of what the role of Israel ought to be, uh, that they ought to be a witness to the nations, that this is, this is what, what the, the role that's given them. Uh, in the end, this really did not take. Uh, Even to this the day. The Jews persevered in the Roman Empire, perhaps as much as 3% of the Roman Empire, but they did that uh, just by um, not going to Nineveh, but just by forming their communities and allowing people in if they did the right things. So, so this, the, we, we would, Judaism never is a, uh, until recent times, developed a, uh, a, a evangelical strength to go out and proclaim the witness of God. That's not a part, except for the uh, Lubavitchers, the, the Chabad. Uh, they, they really want to get out. But for the most part, uh, modern Judaism is not, uh, does not seek uh, to seek the witness of God. It's interesting because, in a sense, it's very consistent with the fact to proclaim that God is the Lord of the world. Then it gives a mission to Israel instead of just preserving themselves and their kingdom to to witness to them. And in a sense, well, see, that's, that's, that's what Jesus will do. I mean, that, that's that's Paul picked up on that. Yeah, and that's one of the major. That's in order to understand Paul, you have to realize that he was fighting against the Jewish tradition here. Uh, the Jewish tradition didn't focus on reaching the Gentiles. The Jewish tradition tolerated the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Well, also, it's pretty exclusive, really, in terms of defining who is Jewish. Oh, yeah. You know, so it's, yeah. not, it's not really the Jewish. Jewish. The Jewish tradition defined itself in the time of Jesus and continues to define itself as a community of God uh, a, that is characterized by following the law. And by your birth. Well, well, but Sammy Davis Jr. We, that, that, yeah, you have to, and, and by your birth mother. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, by your birth mother. But there is, that's not unusual because if you read um, um, the uh, books of Kings, uh, all the mother of every king is identified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, there is some evidence that there is a natural lineal uh, uh, 
element of genes. So. Okay, uh, I'm going to save some for next week, but I want to finish with this. This is kind of a closing uh, closing argument. Uh, chapter 44, starting with verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare it and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us yet or what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. I have not, uh, have I not told you from of old and declared? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know of no one. You've heard some of this before, too. I turn to Revelation 8. Um, I am the Alpha and Omega, uh, says the Lord God who was and who was, uh, who is and was and who is to come. Verse 17. Um, uh, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive for chapter two. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of the first and the last, uh, was dead and came to life. And 21, uh, verse uh, six. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Beta, um, Omega, the beginning and the end. To the Thursday, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the Lord's spring of life. In 22, this is in uh, at the very end, um, when it starts with verse 8, it says, I, John, am the one who saw uh, these things. And when I, I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. And in verse 12, it has Jesus saying, See, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Um, so uh, that's that's that that's the criterion who who God is, and that begins that motif begins with Second Isaiah. Next week, I'm going to talk about. A little, little about who these other gods are. Uh, second Isaiah is really wonderful in describing them. Uh, and then I'll, I'll move on to I'll move on beyond that. Anything else? <laughs> I have just a question of, about Daniel because I, I read back today. So Daniel, the story is pretended to be in Babylon and at that time. So, but you're saying in the first century before Christ. That's correct. And the reason we know that, uh, we even can give it a date, is that's when the, the quote predictions begin to go wrong. That's, uh, that's, that's when they- That's like what they mean, that they, 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 they no, he gets, you know, he says in the time of Belshazzar and all this kind of stuff, oh, yeah. all the, the, the empires with feet of clay and whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then you get up to the end of, uh, um, and, and they predict what actually happened, right? Except the Romans, I think. I don't know. But we see starting in about verse um, chapter six, seven, or eight. That they, they make predictions, uh, Daniel makes predictions that don't happen. And so they, uh, they, they date Daniel from the time those predictions stop. Yeah, but that, that's, that's assuming that Daniel couldn't be inspired by God for what happened. You saying that the, Daniel, the criteria, Daniel the criteria is it's true until that day because. It, it, it's assuming that that God cannot inspire the you know, well, that's true. That. And, and the and, and so. Jews uh, and many Christians believe that all of Daniel is by this kind of inspiration. But he really lived in the time. Uh, okay, you can do that. Uh, the kind of scholarship I come from. Uh, 
believes that that was used as a way of uh, validating uh, Daniel. So that's just a different interpretation of the words of Daniel. It's, po it's possible. I don't believe it, but it's it, you can interpret it that way if you want. So when you talk that way, though, you have this camp, and you have this camp, and you have this book. Uh, and I doubt if there's just two camps, uh, which, which, in my mind, creates a bit of a dichotomy on how you handle all this, because you have bright people on all sides with different ideas about what this really means. That's correct. Uh, <laughs> yes. But that doesn't mean you can't take a stand on, on criteria that are more universal. The, the, the modern day historian of any kind of uh, 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 credible, well, uh, work from facts and try to verify them. Most historians on the right start with a theme of some kind of idea of why things happen. And then what they will do is cite facts to quote, prove it. Okay. Um, and, and how do they know these facts? Well, they know them from particular sources, from testimony, from people who saw it and wrote about it, from uh, hard evidence, uh, stuff you pick out of the ground or uh, from, uh, from all kinds of things. Uh, but these are testable. You can test the facts, whether they're right or wrong. And the thesis, the theme that comes out of that is exactly what you get in the Bible. The Bible theme is that God's in control. And here are the facts to prove it. The difficulty is that the facts um, uh, are of a different nature. For instance, uh, the only thing that we can do to verify historically the resurrection of Jesus Christ is from testimony. Uh, we would like to be able to go back and see it ourselves. And so, for, for those who read science fiction, that kind of thing is. Uh, Coming. We're a couple of years away yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, uh, what we see in the Bible is the creation of a uh, historical thesis. And the Old Testament is uh, the thesis is that God is God of all of creation. And the New Testament, the thesis is that God is incarnate in Jesus Christ who was born. Uh, and ministry was died and was resurrected. And uh, we can't prove any of that to, um, to the standards of modern historians. Uh, Paul tries to do it when he says, uh, so many people saw Jesus, I saw him the resurrected Christ, and so many, like thousands, thousands, it appeared to thousands in Jerusalem, I can't remember the exact number. Uh, Paul tries to use the, the testimony of witness, which is what we're talking about here, witnesses and testimony. But uh, that's it's easy for people today to say those folks were deluded, or that was just propaganda, or uh, that is uh, fiction. So how do we know? Through the Holy Spirit. Uh, that that's the essence of faith. Uh, that's that's personally where I start. But I find it interesting that you know, Isaiah. It's clear you have different author. I mean, you if you like from the story itself, the, the person cannot have lived in all this period. I, I didn't quite hear. I, I'm saying intrinsically in Isaiah. You cannot say it's the same author the whole way because he lived in different, if you like. What he's telling is about different period where a single man cannot have lived. That's right. And, and that's, that's where um, uh, the, the historical principles 
the, the criteria that modern historians use enters the picture because a modern historian will look at the language, look at the message, look at the circumstances of uh, one part of Isaiah, uh, and then look at the language and the theology and the circumstances of another and say, these are two eras. And when will they, uh, how do you date them? Well, you date them by other criteria. Now, uh, and by internal criteria, there are, there are clues uh, to when it was written in all of this, the mention of Cyrus is a clue of when it was written. Um, and the, the, the mention of Nebuchadnezzar is a clue as to when it was written. And so um, uh, this is where the, well, let me, let me step back and say, it is possible to argue that all of Isaiah was written by one person. And some do. The notion of first, second, and third Isaiah uh, only arose in the 20th century, maybe the late 19th century. Um, but that's where that happened because modern historical principles uh, were used in reading Isaiah. So, and that's, that's where, if you look at a fundamentalist, uh, they start from a different premise. They start from the from premise that the words as written are true. And if it says that Isaiah wrote it all is true. And their difficulty then becomes in explaining how Isaiah could have written uh, in the time of Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. Uh, you know, so that's you, you've got historical interpretive problems either way you go. <laughs> and and, and it's, you, you can see it in just in a simple way of explaining um, the, the two genealogies of Jesus. I know, I love that. That's if you try to do that and say they both say the same, right. good luck. Right. So <laughs> how, but there are people who spend their lives doing it. So how did these come to be lumped together in one book? That's the process of um, canonization of the can of the, uh, of the law and the prophets probably was that these, these were collected starting in the exile. Uh, we, we know that some form of exodus already was in existence, but the, all these stuff is collected and put together probably uh, no later than about 400. Uh, and they began to be authoritative. We use the term canonized. Uh, we use the term become authoritative, uh, to become authoritative, something which is studied and believed is true and important and is, is, is an authority. Uh, the third part of the Old Testament, the writings, which includes uh, Lamentations, includes Daniel, uh, includes First and Second Chronicles, and Ezra and Nehemiah, were collected and but, uh, but probably not that canon was probably not closed until about 135 BC. The canon of the New Testament was not closed until about 400 during the time of the, during the Byzantine period. But there were all kinds of there were all just like there were all kinds of prophets that were read uh, that they knew and they were collected but they only collected the ones that were essentially true. In the New Testament period, uh, there were hundreds, hundreds of scriptures uh, that were not accepted as authoritative by the church. And that was an act of the church to do that. This is the canon. And, and the first time we see that, see the books in the New Testament as we know them, is about 330 uh, AD. Um, and which that's we, we, we know from about 180 AD, but most of the books were already authoritative, but we didn't see a complete collection until about 150 years later as to the, the, the books that we now have in the New Testament. Uh, I have to say to just uh... When I was studying to become a lay Methodist preacher 30 years ago, 
we, we it was interesting. We look at Noah's story, and I, I, I mean, as a more evangelical side or something like that, I was believing it, it's a single text. And they say, okay, there are sometimes two animals, two two pairs, and there are seven pairs. Okay. Yeah, and they say, okay, set, look at the text, took all the verse which are second two pairs. I mean, two pairs of animals. All the words which are seven seven pairs. Okay. And then look the name and one one text is with Elohim uh, as the name of God, and the other is yeah. is uh, Yahweh. And say, okay, there were two texts, <laughs> and they assembled. Yeah. I mean, it was it was it really. I say, okay, I'm, I'm persuaded. I mean, because yeah. I, I'm a scientist, I, I like I like to do things myself. So you you do all that yourself, then you look say. Oh dear! I mean, this, this, I mean, this and, and that doesn't uh, doesn't change in a sense. Yeah. And, and the difficulty, okay. of course, is um, uh, how do you uh, uh, who says which is true? Yeah. And that's a matter of faith. But uh, but from that primary choice, a lot flows. Mm -hmm. Oh right! Yeah, no kidding. But, but it doesn't it doesn't change anything on the authority of this text, in a sense. Well, but it, it, no, it, the text itself doesn't. It makes claims for itself. But what we accept as authoritative, what we accept as canon, and how it was developed, is a fundamental decision we have to make. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.